Welcome to an Inspector Calls Act 1, Part 1. We're introduced to the characters. We've got Arthur Burling and his wife, Sybil Burling. We've got Sheila Burling, their daughter, who is getting engaged to Gerald Croft. We've got Eric Burling, their son. We've got their maid, Edna. And then we've, of course, got Inspector Ghoul. We've got some information on the character page. All three acts, which are continuous, take place in the dining room of the Burlings House in Brumley, an industrial city in the North Midlands. It's evening in spring 1912. The important bit that we're going to remember is that it's set in 1912, but it was written in 1945, 1946, just at the end of the Second World War, but it was set in their past, 1912. Act one starts with the stage directions to help the director know what the stage should look like and obviously to help the audience understand what is happening. So we've got a large suburban house belonging to a prosperous manufacturer. So a rich person who owns the factory, he makes things, he manufactures things, has good solid furniture of the time. So it's not old furniture, it looks old to us now. It's It was new to them at the time. The general effect is substantial and heavily comfortable, but not cosy and home-like. As we get back down to the bottom of these stage directions, the lighting should be pink and intimate until the inspector arrives, and then it should be brighter and harder. And you see these two images here. If we think about the power of lighting on a stage, so we've got, sort of got the scene with pink light at the top. We've got a similar scene with brighter white light. You see how it sets a different atmosphere. That's what Priestley wanted for the stage. So it's a pink and intimate glow. When we first meet the family, when the inspector arrives, it changes to be brighter and harder lighting. We're still looking at the stage directions here. So we've got the four Burlings. Can we see them there uh, in the images? And they're sat around the table. We've got Edna the maid. She's clearing the table. And Priestley tells us what she's clearing. So we've got champagne glasses, we've got a cigar box, we've got cigarettes, we've got a decanter of port. Can you see those things there? Why has Priestley chosen those? He's telling us something about the family. He wants us to know something about the characters very quickly. And of course, what we can tell is that they are prosperous, they are wealthy, they have money. These are objects that are owned by people who with money at this time. So we get told what they're wearing. They're in evening dress. They're, they're wearing their best clothes. It's like party clothes. They're celebrating. Arthur Burling is a heavy looking, rather pretentious man in his middle 50s with fairly easy manners, but rather provincial in his speech. Provincial means almost coming from a place that's not in the city. He now enjoys the wealth of the city, but it's not where he's from. His wife is about 50. We've got a picture of her there, a rather cold woman. Her husband's social superior. So she comes from more money than he does. Sheila, their daughter, is a pretty girl in her early 20s, very pleased with life and excitable. Gerald Croft, who she's getting engaged to, is an attractive chap. In these pictures there, he's with his top hat on. Rather too manly to be a dandy. A dandy was... Um, a description of men who were very into their fashion at the time, uh, often sort of socialising at parties, uh, but very much the easy, well-bred. He also comes from money, well-bred young man about town. Eric, the other Burling's son, is in his early 20s, not quite at ease, half shy, half assertive. At the moment, they've all had a good dinner. They're celebrating and they're pleased. We can imagine the noise of them celebrating, laughter, um, cheersing of the glasses, eating the dinner. The play opens with Mr Burling talking. I think that's an interesting choice. What does that tell us about society at the time? It opens with Mr Burling saying, giving us the port Edna, because of course Edna is the maid. He's not going to get his own port. Uh, we can see a picture of port there. It's a sort of alcohol like a wine. Giving us the port, Edna, that's right. He pushes it towards Eric. Eric is marrying his daughter. You ought to like this port, Gerald. As a matter of fact, Finchley told me it's exactly the same port as your father gets from him. We can see instantly on the opening of the play, Mr Burling is trying to impress Gerald. He wants to impress him. He wants to be welcomed into Gerald's family. Gerald comes from a wealthier family. 
Gerald says, then it'll be all right. The port will be all right. The government prides himself on being a good judge of port. I don't pretend to know much about it. We've then got Sheila, the daughter of the Burlings. Gaily, happily, possessively also is an interesting stage direction. I should jolly well think not, Gerald. I'd hate you to know all about port, like one of those purple-faced old men. So the first thing that we hear from Sheila is her opinion on the older generation of what these older men get up to, that they're drinking too much port, they've gone purple-faced. It's not not respecting her elders particularly, is it? So her father goes, here, I'm not a purple-faced old man. No, not yet, but then you don't know all about port, do you? Mr Burling notices that his wife hasn't had any. Come on, Sybil, you must have a drink. It's a special occasion. So we already are told as the audience that there's something special happening. Sheila encourages her mum, go on mummy, you must drink our health. So Mrs Burling, Mrs B here, she's smiling very well, just a little, thank you. And then she talks to Edna, all right Edna, I'll ring for the drawing room when we want coffee. So Edna is quickly dismissed. She's a very small part, but she's still important to think about. Immediately, we discover some foreshadowing of what is about to happen. So let's have a look here in this next bit of the play. Um, So they're enjoying their dinner. And we've got Sheila, the daughter, sort of mock arguing there. We see with mock aggressiveness in the directions, um, sort of teasing her husband to be, go on, Gerald, just you object. He says, wouldn't dream of it. I've wanted to be with you. I want to marry you for a long time, haven't I? You know I have. And the mother, Mrs Burling, is also very pleased. Of course she does. But Sheila now switches, half serious, half playful. Yes, except for all last summer when you never came near me and I wondered what had happened to you. This is foreshadowing. Something that's going to happen later. It plants a seed in the audience of, oh, what happened last summer? We also quickly get introduced to the theme of inequality, in this case between gender, although throughout the play there's different inequalities that we meet. We can see Mrs Burling at the bottom there. Now, Sheila, don't tease him. When you're married, you'll realise that men with important work to do sometimes have to spend nearly all their time and energy on their business. You just have to get used to that, just as I had. We're being reminded of the roles of middle class women at the time and Mrs Burling's trying to prepare her that men will be busy, they're doing important things and it's not for us to question or worry about it. We can see this little cartoon here and it's reminding us of the suffragette movement that was happening at the time. If we think about context of when the play was set, women in Britain still didn't have the right to vote and this, the group of women and men called the suffragettes and the suffragists were campaigning for women to have the right to vote. So that was happening at the time when the play was set, women did not have the right to vote, they couldn't own property. The gender divide was much stronger than when the play was being shown in 1945. And of course, compared to now, much, much stronger. But if we think about the audience, they felt like they had moved on a little bit since then. Sheila's response to her mother um, very quickly reminds us again of that age divide, the generational divide. She says, I don't believe I will. And then half playful, half serious. So you be careful. So she's saying to her mother and her family, I'm not going to quite follow in the patterns of behaviour that you've been following in. We've then got quite a fun moment where we hear from Eric for the first time. So Eric's character is introduced with a sudden guffaw. So he sort of bursts out laughing and people are sort of confused. What's the joke? And he says, I don't know. Really, suddenly I felt I just had to laugh. And she says, oh, you're squiffy, meaning drunk. I'm not. And we also, that age gap again, that generational divide again. What an expression, the mother says. Sheila, really the things you girls pick up these days. We're reminded that times are changing, that young women are wanting, some young women are wanting something different than what their mothers had and what rights they had. Um, So we see this sort of playful falling out. If you think that's the best you can do, don't be an ass, Eric. Now stop it, you two, Arthur. They're definitely the young two. We've got that couple 
the sister and the brother arguing amongst themselves. What about this famous toast, Mr. Burling? Do tell us. So Mr. Burling says, yes, of course, and very self-importantly <coughs> clears his throat. He really believes that when he speaks, people will listen and he's got something useful to say. So he's talking about how he's sad when he's meant, he's there giving a toast that his daughter's getting married. They're celebrating an engagement. But actually, let's look what he starts off saying. It's a pity Serge George and uh, Lady Croft can't be with us. They're Gerald's parents, the richer people that he's trying to impress. It's a pity they couldn't be with us, but they're aboard and it can't be helped. As I told you, they sent me a very nice cable. That's a message that was sent then. I couldn't be nicer. I'm not sorry we're celebrating quietly like this. So he's he sort of is sorry, isn't he? He sort of wishes it was a bigger celebration and that they could enjoy the wealth of the other family. Um, but Eric, again, butts in here, not too rudely. Well, don't do any. We'll drink their health and have done it. We don't need to make a speech, Father. Just we'll have a drink. Mr. Berlin continues with his toast celebrating the engagement. He says it's the happiest night of his life. I hope you'll understand one day. It means a lot to me. It means a tremendous lot to me. But let's see what he then talks about in a, the main part of his speech here. He does say, I want you to be happy. But this line, you're just the kind of son-in-law I always wanted. Your father and I have been friendly rivals in business for some time now. So he's talking about business again. He's talking about how marrying into this wealthy family is actually something that he's really keen to happen. He really wants the two companies, Croft Limited and Burling Limited, I guess, um, coming together and hopefully they'll no longer be competing. They can work together for lower costs and higher prices. So there's a lot of financial gain for him through this marriage, or so he thinks, and he's very excited about it. And Gerald says, here, here, I think my father would agree. Mrs. Burling does say, I don't think you ought to talk business on an occasion like this. And Sheila also says, neither do I. They, you know, it's her engagement, isn't it? So it's quite so. I only mentioned it in passing. Um, but did he? It felt like he said it for quite a long time. As the toast continues, uh, they're toasting to Sheila's health and happiness. Um, and the ring gets produced so we can see, well, perhaps this will help to stop you crying. He produces the ring box. Sheila's excited. Oh, you got it. What's interesting about Sheila's response to the ring? She says, is it the one you wanted me to have? It's interesting that he has chosen it and she just wants to keep him happy. And she says, he says, yes, the very one. And she says, oh, it's wonderful. Look, mummy, isn't it a beautiful, be isn't it a beauty? Look, mummy, we're reminded that she's young immature. She's saying, mummy, even though she's in her 20s at this point. Oh, darling, she's very pleased with the ring. She's excited about the uh, engagement. And she says, I think it's perfect. I'm now I really feel engaged. Sheila's really excited. She says, I'll never let the ring out of my sight. And we're reminded about that gender divide again. Mrs. Burling says, great. We're going to leave you men to it. Look now, Arthur, if you've got no more to say, I think Sheila and I had better go to the drawing room and leave you men. So men would talk about different things to women. They would often divide at the end of a night. Burling, we can see here, Mr. Burling says, oh, are you listening, Sheila? She looks like she's distracted by her lovely engagement ring that she's been given. But no, no, he wants her to pay attention to him. This concerns you too. She says, oh, I'm sorry, daddy. Again, her immaturity here. Actually, I was listening. Mr. Burling then starts another long sort of speech that potentially nobody asked for. I'm delighted about this engagement. Hopefully it won't be too long. And again, look what he chooses to talk about. He says, I speak as a hard-headed businessman. This is what he thinks about all the time. It's what he thinks matters. And he wants to talk about the silly pessimistic talk that has been happening at the time. So there's been talk around the factories, things have been happening, and he wants to bring it up now at this party. You'll marry, you'll be marrying at a good time. Yes, a very good time. And soon it'll be an even better time. Last month, just because the miners came out on strike, there's labour trouble. But don't worry, we employers, so the people who own the factories, at last are coming together to see that your interests your interest being Sheila and the young people potentially, and the interests of capital, like capitalism, money, um, are properly properly protected and we're in for a time of steadily increasing prosperity. So he's talking again about business. Eric 
We don't hear from him much so far, but he asks about the war. What about the war? Surely, Dad, that's a bad thing. And Mr. Burling's on, on his path of his his speech now. Glad you mentioned it, Eric. I'm just about to come and talk to you about this. So he's saying, oh, just because there are some German officers drinking, it's fiddlesticks. The Germans don't want war. Nobody wants more. There's not going to be a war. And Eric says, yes, I know. But still, Mr. Burling takes over again. He's not interested in hearing what Eric thinks about the war. Just let me finish. You've a lot to learn yet. You're young, he says. You don't know anything. You're my son. I know things. I'm talking as a hard-headed practical man of business, so I understand war and you do not. There's not a chance of war. The war's developing so fast, war will be impossible. Now remember, this play was set in 19, in the early 1911, 1912, um, but it was, it was made and produced and performed in 1945. So this allows the audience to uh, to enjoy some dramatic irony that's a literary device where the audience knows something to be true but the characters do not so the audience at the time knew that world war one would happen so we get to as the audience see mr burling as what we get to see him as not as clever as he thinks we know that what he thinks is not true that war is coming and the fact that he is so sure that there is no war changes our opinion of his character He's not as clever as he thinks. He doesn't know everything because he's wrong. It goes on in this speech. We get to enjoy some more dramatic irony as an audience. Why, a friend of mine went over this new liner last week, the Titanic. She sails next week. It's unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. Again, as an audience that was later on, we know that the Titanic tragically did sink. So we get to enjoy Mr. Burling's stupidity almost that he was so sure of things but actually was very wrong. Mr Berlin continues doubling down with his predictions of the future that the audience know the outcomes of and he says look let's say in 1940 in 20 or 30 years time you might be having a party for your children here and I tell you by that time you'll be living in a world that have forgotten all of these capital versus labour agitations. He's referring to the strikes where lots of workers of factories were refusing to work for so little pay or for poor working conditions and he's saying it will be so long gone by 1940. The play was released in 1945 and so the audience knew that that was not true. The audience knew that that was not the case. It wouldn't be this perfect world where they were enjoying relaxing with their money. There wasn't peace and prosperity. Look, there'll be peace and prosperity. The war, Second World War, has now happened. So the audience really know how wrong Mr. Burling is. And we can see he also alludes to two other authors here. We've got, we can't let these Bernard Shaws and H.G. Wellses. They are authors that he is referring to who had political beliefs. So we can see H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds, and Bernard Shaw, who wrote Pygmalion. If you wanted to research the themes of those books, you might find that really interesting too. But we've got him saying that the world is going to be better. We're almost there. We're on the up, which we get to enjoy as dramatic irony. Mr. Berlin continues and he actually shows some of his insecurities next. So we can see him talking to Gerald, his future son-in-law, who he believes is socially superior to him of a higher class with more wealth. We can see him saying, oh, I'm really worried. I have an idea that your mother doesn't object to Sheila, but thinks that you could have done better for yourself socially. You, you could have married someone with more money, with more class. Cheryl gets rather embarrassed. Again, us being shown that difference between the older generation and the younger generation. The younger generation seem less bothered by class and money here. Um, but so to impress Gerald, Mr. Burling says, um, I might be on my way to the next honours list to have a knighthood, which is where the king or queen awards you for your service to the country. You get a medal, you get a title like sir. Um, so he's trying to impress still. Don't worry, I know that we're below you, Gerald, but we're coming up in the world. So he says, oh, it's not a definite, but a definite, it's a very good chance of a knighthood. Um, Gerald laughs, which is an interesting response to that, politely, but perhaps isn't as impressed as Mr. Burling hopes. We again get reminded about the differences um, in society for men and women, particularly middle class women. Here we're talking about women who don't go to work, but of course at the time, like the maid, um, 
women of a lower class did work. They went to factories, they worked very hard, um, but middle class women stayed at home. And we can see here Mr. Berlin giving his advice uh, to the younger men. Oh, you must remember, my boy, clothes mean something quite different to a woman, not just something to wear. Uh, it makes them look pretty. So it reminds us of their opinion of women, of their the women that they are married to or in their families. They're interested in different things. They understand different things. It's Mr. Burling talking here at the top of the page, and he says something quite revealing about his character here. By the way, some of these cranks talk and write now, you'd think everybody has to look after everybody else as if we were all mixed up together like bees in a hive, community and all that nonsense. So Mr. Burling really believes that you look after yourself and your family and that is your responsibility you look after yourself and your family and he takes that responsibility very seriously and he's saying that people are talking these days that we should have community that we should look after each other that we should care more about each other and he says all that nonsense but take my word for it you youngsters again he is old and wise and they are young and naive and he is there to impart his knowledge, he believes. I've learned in the good hard school of experience that a man has to mind his own business and look after himself and his own. He really doesn't believe we have social responsibility for others. We've then got an important stage direction. We hear the sharp ring of a front doorbell, which cuts Mr. Burling's speech. He's still talking. We see and and we see those dashes. Look, it interrupts him. And Eric says, somebody at the front door, Edna will answer it. He doesn't need to worry. We'll have another glass of port. That'll stop me giving you good advice. Yes, you've piled it on a bit tonight, Father. He's really gone for it with all of his, his thoughts about business and the world, hasn't he? We've got Edna who returns. We don't see her often in the play, but she is important. Please, sir, an inspector's called. And an inspector, what kind of inspector, he asks. And a police inspector, he says his name's Inspector Gould. So Edna helps introduce the new character to the stage. Bernie says, I don't know him. Does he want to see me? Yes, sir. He says it's important. So we can see right before we meet the inspector, we had the doorbell interrupt what was happening, it interrupted Mr. Burling's talking. And as we come to the end of this section, it's not the end of the act, but the end of this section of Act 1, we've got Edna opening the door and announcing Inspector Gould. We've then got this stage direction telling us what's happened. The inspector enters and we know from the stage directions at the start of the act, the lighting changes now. So it was pink and intimate before. The lighting changes now as the inspector arrives. It describes the character. The inspector doesn't need to be a big man, but he creates at once an impression of massiveness, solidity and purposefulness. He's a man in his 50s, dressed in a plain darkish suit of the period. He speaks carefully, weightily and has a disconcerting habit of looking hard at the person he addresses before actually speaking. So if we think about that change in lighting, there's a change in atmosphere and the audience is anticipating what that is. So as we think about the purpose, why has Priestley created the opening of Act One like this? Well, it introduces the main characters to us and actually by dropping us right into an event, the celebration, we learn a lot about them very quickly. So it allows us to understand the relationships between each of the characters, a hint at the relationships between them. We understand immediately the wealth and status of the characters through what they say, through the stage um, directions, the type of scenery there is. And we're introduced to the themes of social justice, the themes of class and inequality. Some next steps for you, if you wanted to further deepen your knowledge of this section of the play, would be go to, to go through the bit that we've just gone through and identify and find some key quotes for each character. So could you find two to three quotes that tell us something about each character? Could be something they say or something that is said about them. It could also be in the stage directions. So could you go and gather some quotes for each of the characters from the section that we've just gone through?